Media and news literacy are crucial skills for everyone. They're necessary for strong, functional public discourse, public health, and the health of democracies. Media literacy isn't easy. There's a lot that goes into cultivating and maintaining the critical thinking that makes it happen. I'm Michael Depp, editor of TV News Check, and this is Inside the Media, the show that looks at the business of the news and the people who make it. Today is the second of our two-part look at media and news literacy. Last time we talked about how digital and social media have made media literacy far more complicated than when media was a one-directional, simpler entity. We looked at the basic premise of media as constructions, as made things that need to be read as such, and we started talking about how to do that kind of reading. Today, we'll examine what media literacy training looks like in schools. How do you introduce the idea to young children, and how do you hone that training as a child grows cognitively? And what are the implications of media illiteracy on a child's mental health? We'll be right back with that discussion. My guests today are Neil Anderson. He is president of the Association for Media Literacy, an organization that looks to foster understanding and appreciation of how media work, how they are organized, and how they produce meaning. It also wrote Ontario's media literacy curriculum. Glennis Vivian is a primary teacher and a well-being lead with the York Region District School Board in Markham, Ontario, where she helps to implement media literacy instruction in conjunction with the Association for Media Literacy. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, what are kids studying when they study media literacy? I'm not sure I can answer that completely. I can say what they might be studying. I can say what I hope they're studying. We apply a very broad definition to media. We include the electronic media that everybody's excited about right now, uh, such as the, uh, the fake news, et cetera, the social media. But clothing and architecture are also media. Going for a walk in a park is also a media experience. And we have to realize that as well. We hope that the students are going to be learning some of the codes and the conventions because each medium and each even medium form has unique codes and conventions that we need to understand so that we can be proficient as we use those communications. And these days it isn't a choice. These days we have to use them. It's a job requirement. We're also hoping that they will uh, study the physiological responses, the effects of some of the media. What does it mean to be barraged by sound effects in a video game? What does it mean to have control as you do what they call death scrolling through? What are our physiological responses to those media experiences? We're also hoping that they will take a look at their relationships with media and how might they be healthy relationships. Um, if they're not healthy, what might we do about that? And that brings me to agency. I talk to a lot of teachers, parents, not so many students who are feeling rather helpless. They're feeling over, overwhelmed by things, by the choice, by the fact that their children or their students are using uh, media uh, in ways that they consider to be inappropriate. And maybe they're not inappropriate. Maybe that's just the way things are these days. That may be the way that society is evolving. But we all need to think about our agency. What can we do? And in fact, Michael, you are exercising that right now. You are exercising your agency in choosing to talk to me. That is, that is a lot to, to sort of juggle for, for emerging minds. A, a lot of different things in there, starting with the foundation of everything is a text, which is a fascinating idea, which I completely endorse, but, uh, but not always an easy one for, for people to grasp. So your group successfully lobbied to get media literacy education incorporated into the Ontario provincial curriculum. Why was it important to do so? Education is constantly in catch-up mode to be relevant to people's communication needs. A language classroom understandably engages reading and writing. 
that's a given. But in 2022, social media are also language-based experiences that people need to understand, whether they're using words or images or sounds, they are also language-based experiences, and therefore they need to be a part of a language-based classroom. Civics, for instance, is a really interesting example. How do we know our politicians? How do we decide to vote? We're having an election right now in Ontario, and the only print that I see are the lawn signs. Everything else is online. And therefore, we have to understand that in order to be civically aware, civically responsible. And just, just uh, to be clear, where is media literacy education compulsory across Canada, Neil? Is it it's every province and territory at this point? It is in every province and territory. In some cases, it's sometimes hard to locate. It has been blended with other ideas. Ontario has the most distinct and articulate media literacy curriculum. It also has a media literacy box on its elementary report card. In other jurisdictions, it is blended with students' language marks. Ontario is just beginning a rewrite of its language and literature curricula. As we speak, we're just establishing, I'm on the team with a group of other people we haven't yet met. And I hope it will include a very broad definition of media, such as I hinted at earlier, and a broad definition of literacy. Fascinating. So, Glennis, you work with primary school students. So we're talking about kindergartners through eighth graders here. These have got to be some very small incremental steps, I would think, that you're taking to introduce these concepts to kids so young. How do you begin that process? Uh, so the Ontario Curriculums Media Program is designed on a continuum, much like some of their other subjects as well. Um, and as Neil mentioned, it has its own strand in literacy. And it introduces these media concepts really early on, and then it gradually builds on their complexity grade over grade. Uh, so in early years, students are learning about what constitutes a media source. Uh, and according to the Ontario Curriculum, media texts are defined as any work similar to what Neil was saying, uh, object or event that communicates meaning to an audience. Uh, so that's pretty broad. They look at different types of media to understand how media texts use words, graphics, sounds, images, print, oral, visual, or electronic form to communicate information and ideas to their audience. And then as they move up, the grades and get older, they introduce concepts uh, like intended audience or the purpose of media and bias um, into the media studies curriculum continuum. And then while traditional literacy studies uh, focus primarily on the understanding of the word written and read, media literacy focuses on the construction of meaning through a combination of several media languages like these images, sounds, graphics, and words all together. So just to make this a little bit more concrete, for the youngest kids, the kindergartners, first, second graders, what would just, just briefly, what would a lesson look like? What, what would, how would you begin to introduce that, the first couple of concepts to them pragmatically? Uh, in kindergarten, they might show them a video, uh, maybe a Sesame Street video, and say this is an example of media. And this is an example in video format. Now we're going to listen to a podcast. That's an example of an audio media format. Here is a, a written news article for kids. So they'll, they'll show you various different types, and they might point out a couple key features here and there, but they don't dig very deeply into the key features until they get a little bit older and they can grasp that because the end game in the curriculum is that they can eventually produce their own media that follows those key features and criteria. Okay, so speaking of end games, Neil, what are the overarching goals then for a child who goes through this, in this case, the Ontario curriculum from K to 12? What should that child emerge ultimately knowing how to do? As parents, Michael, we want our children to thrive in their adult lives. And maybe very specifically, we don't want them to live in the basement. That means personally, professionally, and civically. Graduates need to know how to use the full range of mediated communications proficiently and ethically. They need these skills for their working lives but also so that they can navigate and advocate for the political supports they need. I don't phone or write my city council person. 
Our communications are electronic, either video or conferencing or email. Media are also major supports in our personal lives, facilitating our many personal relationships and obligations. We need to learn how to do all of that effectively and ethically. Glennis, when I was a kid, I would be assigned a research project. I'd go to the library. I'd get some guidance from teachers and librarians. I'd find my way to some relevant sources, namely those would be books and physical articles at the time. And then I'd be on my way to writing up some sort of report. The internet has obviously changed all that. So as an educator, how do you start to tackle how to find and contextualize sources online with kids? And how and when can they even begin to wrap their heads around that process of contextualizing that information that they find? Um, it, so this is a huge piece in media, and especially now because of we have so many children worldwide who have been learning online during COVID times, and they're being exposed to massive amounts of media information on a regular basis. And students are becoming more and more adept at using their devices and finding media information. Um, and this media that they're experiencing can have major impacts on the way they think or how they navigate their lives or even the opportunities that they may have access to in their futures. Um, and this is why teachers are working with students over time to build their capacity because they need to be able to th think critically and intentionally about how they interpret and use media information. It's not just going to a book anymore. Now the curriculum is built intentionally so that we can teach students from an early age to understand how media texts are designed. They all have a purpose. They all are designed for a specific audience and they need to learn how to question what they learn from media responsibly. It's all about responsibility, which is also one of the things that we report on for students. So they're taught things like identifying the difference between fact and fiction in media. Uh, the whole fake news things that, that Neil mentioned earlier, and the credibility of resources is a really big piece of it. So they have to triangulate their, their uh, research. Um, they have to recognize, learn how to recognize bias and discriminatory portrayals in the media and how to process depictions of violence and crime because they have uh, uninterrupted encounters with media and often not supervised encounters with media. And they, these tools are necessary for kids these days. And they're often navigating these media sources on their own. So will the instruction often be to bring some, some article, let's say, in front of the child or the, the class and just sort of look at, it, look at it together and parse out the headline if there is one and the, the kind of language that's being used or the the context clues of the publication which it's appearing that kind of instruction yeah so at the beginning that you might just say this is this type of media text for instance this is a podcast and then you might play it for them and then you're going to give them a graphic organizer that says okay the key features of a podcast are this and this and this um and can you identify the audience that this podcast is targeted to and what is the main purpose and are they trying to persuade you of anything is there any bias in this podcast. Those are the kinds of things. But first, it's we, we do a gradual release of responsibility. So first, we model it, demonstrate it, uh, sort of label it, and then we get them to go out on their own and bring it. But typically, for especially for the younger grades, the teachers will provide the resources to students rather than have them just go out and Google something and find it on their own. That comes later when they have the tools to be able to filter things responsibly. So all of those questions can be tricky questions to ask of a text and a podcast. There's no barrier to entry to making a podcast. It's so, you know, almost anybody can do it with a couple of tools. So, so you can have a veneer of professionalism around something. And, and some of those questions are, the answers can be somewhat insidious. So, you know, difficult to do. Social media is getting more and more like that. Even TikToks now, kids see more TikToks than any other social media is what I'm seeing. Yeah. Right, right. So, Glennis, is it the case that the study of media literacy eventually ends up winding its way through a lot of different subjects in the classroom? I mean, it's not always just segregated then as its own explicit topic, is it? No, definitely not. The, the use of media is intrinsic in many of the things that the students are going to be doing throughout their academic career. So they set it up in the curriculum to be explicitly taught as a skill under literacy, but the analysis of media... Um, 
uh, is in the literacy program, but the implications of what they learn in that media literacy program touches on all the learning in their other subjects. So students learn what they're uh, Re when they're researching a topic and they're looking for credible resources or they're trying to identify that key information from subject matter experts, then they learn as they get older um, the key features and then in the different forms of media so that then they can go on to create their own works of media, which, as I said, is kind of the end goal uh, that fits within those parameters. And this is when I say that there's formal media and informal media. So the formal media that they're producing according to the curriculum for school might be things like uh, slideshows for presentations, or we do podcasts sometimes with students, or they might do a commercial uh, persuasive piece of media. Neil, much of your group AML's teaching is rooted in the work of a very famous Canadian philosopher, Marshall McLuhan, whose work was foundational in media theory. Just briefly, where are you drawing from his work and what are some of the key ideas that you're trying to impart to students without being too esoteric here? Yes, he was famous for being esoteric, but we've really been able to benefit from his ideas. His greatest gift was to tell us to pay attention, to be reflective. He took popular culture seriously, which is a great idea because popular culture is a major force in our lives. Pop culture shows us how to relate to each other and which values are important. Those are pretty important ideas. McLuhan also helped us realize that each technology forms a unique bond with us, extending our communications and our thinking. Most of us cannot imagine leaving home without our smartphones. But do we reflect on why that is? Is it because our smartphones extend who we are or what we know or what we think. I think we need to reflect in our relationships with technologies because then we can influence them. McLuhan's theories raise our awareness and help us do that. They give us methods and language to better understand our relationships to media and mediated experiences. So two major dynamics have really upended media literacy studies for kids. First, the advent of social media, and then the pandemic, when essentially everyone was, uh, was forced to experience school solely through the lens of their phones or their tablets or laptops for long stretches of time. Neil, let's tackle social media first. How did it change media literacy studies? Well, you're quite correct about the two dynamics, Michael, but I would suggest that they are both media experiences, that the pandemic has been a media experience. In fact, a very very violent one for almost all of us. Social media have had multiple effects. They coincided with mobile phones so that we weren't just interacting with thousands of people. We were able to send and receive social media messages remotely from restaurants, from parks, from campsites. We, we just love that. We were unlocked from our desktops so we could share our vacations, our fandom, our tragedies, all in real time. And that creates an immediacy. And that immediacy has had a profound impact on our relationships and our actions. It has challenged our abilities to think and act in real time. How often have some of us regretted sending a message we should have reflected on or erased a message we were about to send because we did reflect on it? It has also democratized communications. Now anyone with internet access can create and share messages with thousands of others. This is a thrilling experience for everybody. Along with the amplification of ideas has come the realization that some of those ideas are toxic. That is a free speech hazard of democracy. It's just an occupational hazard that democracy suffers. Media literacy education must acknowledge our freedom and power, and help students realize why and how they must act carefully or full of care. Glennis, nearly every kid today is equipped with some sort of electronic device through which they're processing media, and those devices became indispensable to all of us during the pandemic. How did that experience have an impact on the importance and the urgency of media literacy in your experience every day in the classroom working with kids? Um, the pandemic has made access to media a basic human right, at least in 
North America. Um, so never before have we seen students in the public school system have so much access to devices and by extension media literacy, um, as had to happen when we were isolating and we all had to flip to an online model. We were very lucky in my school board to be able to accommodate this massive shift in academic, uh, educational programming. Everything was being taught through media literacy at all times. And even now uh, in my school board, we're teaching in a hybrid model. So we're both in person and online students are being taught simultaneously. So that means that the vast majority of learning happens in the realm of media. So students and teachers have had to reconfigure how we learn together and how we teach. And then without this media literacy education for the last two years, I don't think that public education um, would have functioned. I think it would have been virtually impossible to keep functioning. Really? So absolutely existential then. Um, we're, we're coming to get a more vivid picture of just how social media and amplified media consumption during the pandemic plus isolation has had a corrosive effect on children's mental health. I would like for both of you to weigh in on what you think the damage has been uh, from this dynamic happening, starting with you, Neil. Uh, it's ironic, if not hilarious, that adults' concerns about children's overuses of media were swept aside when schooling became an online experience. It accelerated technological uses exponentially. Teachers who had barely used social media with their students found themselves doing so for hours a day with little or no preparation. It was a crash course. And some of them crashed. You're on mute became the standard rallying cry. I think that one of the effects of video conferencing has been to remind us of the rich face-to-face -face live experiences we've lost. Those little portraits tiled on my screen just make me realize how I am a person who prefers live interactions. I think it makes some of us feel lonelier. I've heard that echoed at the same time it's also brought the world closer together. I mean, we can have this, this show having coming from three different places together to a, to a fourth place to, to have the conversation. So it doesn't, it's not all negative entirely. I mean, that we have this, this capability and I don't think that the, you, there might be more ambivalence among its users than, than necessarily a negative adverse reaction to it. Right. And you asked me earlier about McLuhan, who was very clear that, Every technology has benefits and hazards, and we have to learn both of those. So, Glennis, I'd like you also to weigh in on what you think that that damage has been over this period of time. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a it's a double sided coin because we're a society of super media users now that we weren't really before, especially our children. And we're all adept at many new things that we may have never contemplated pre COVID. Unfortunately, we're also facing a global wave of mental health issues, according to many experts in the field. So I've seen this happening myself. I can speak to the microcosm of my school. So I'm the school's well-being lead, and I have been for the past five years. Um, and as such, I've had the opportunity to assess our communities, that's student, staff, and parental well-being. So we've conducted and studied the data results of many surveys throughout these years, uh, and they indicated definite struggle with well-being as a result of the impacts of COVID. And this is not surprising since we've been living in a state of normalized trauma for some time now, but many of us have been isolated from peers, family, and friends for various reasons. Uh, for those in isolation, media has provided a lifeline to the world. For others who now perform the bulk of their work online, such as myself, media has become a taskmaster reality through which we perform our duties. So we're constantly struggling with new platforms, being on screens all day, performing on cameras for hours on end, uh, being reliant on the almighty Wi-Fi. All of these stressors add up over time, and we're starting to see the repercussions. It's becoming more evident in things such as gaps in learning for students, a decrease in socialization skills, a decrease in the ability to focus and complete tasks, that's for students and adults, uh, as well as an increase in social anxieties and depression. It could so, take years to resolve these impacts. So it's fractured our attention span somewhat? made us feel more socially withdrawn as well. Yeah, because we've had the option of turning off our cameras or shutting down 
if we don't want to participate. So it's really difficult when I see students who have been home for some of them two years now return to school. It's taking months before they can get back to that normalized, socialized interaction with other people. So, so to either of you can take this, how can better media literacy help mitigate this problem? Well, we can't solve problems we can't understand. So media literacy can help us define our problems. Then ideally it can give us the skills we need to address them. that reference I made to agency. If we're anxious or depressed, we need to reflect and discover why that might be. Then we can take steps to improve. For some people, that might mean less media use, but for others, it might mean smarter media use. There are many ways of using social media, for example. We need to negotiate the way that is best for us. If I could add on to what Neil just said, um, I think that that is a good point that the use of media uh, to best navigate our way through this dilemma would be different for everyone. I think that we, we would be well advised to further our education on these media skills so that we're better equipped to recognize our individual needs and the impacts of, that media has had on our overall well-being after these last two years. And I think that we need to really dig into teaching the appropriate, uh, how to approach media critically, because it allows us to be active participants, to have that agency in how media impacts us rather than be passive observers, because we've spent a lot of the last two years being passive observers. And we need to provide students in particular tools that are required to use media to our advantage while recognizing its downfalls. Passivity is the enemy of agency. Um, Neil, I'm going to give you the final word here. Um, Thank you. Give, given the accelerated weaponization of media for disinformation and how inextricable media has become in our lives from moment to moment, what happens next with the teaching of media, media literacy? Where does it next evolve to help people make sense of all with which they're being barraged? Your question uh, uses the word barrage, suggesting that our mediated experiences are huge and potentially overpowering, and Glennis has already testified for that. Some people refer to social media apps as fire hoses of information. One media literacy scholar took a social media vacation because she was receiving 700 messages a day. Media literacy education is about power, the power that media exert on us and the power that we might ex exercise in response. We need to understand the advantages and the risks and know how to navigate among them. We already do this with other aspects of our lives. For example, foods. Just as we are what we eat, we are what we watch, listen to, and post. We need to be as mindful and deliberate about our media uses as we are about our diets. Fair enough. Well, we've run out of time for this conversation, so I want to thank Glennis Vivian and Neil Anderson for being part of it. You can learn more about the Association for Media Literacy and the work it does here on the link on the screen. Join me again next time where we'll take another close look at how the media is made and who's making it. See you then.